Hello, Dr. Ken here today with a lecture from my Roman history class on Gaius Julius Caesar. Of course, anyone is welcome to watch this, but it is specifically for my Roman history class who have the notes and slides. Um, we have met Caesar already in uh, the seminar and lecture on Pompey Magnus. We are now focusing on Caesar as the topic or as the central focus for this lecture. It's important to remember that what we're studying at the moment um, is Rome in the throes of civil war. Um, and during this period of time, as I've said before, a certain number of, of prominent individuals emerge. Um, and I dare say at no other time in Roman history um, is that the case, that we get so many extraordinary individuals, something about this era seems to have promoted them. Julius Caesar is, of course, one of these. He deserves to be called a master of politics, and he was equally great in understanding general political trends as he was in directing them. He was also, first and foremost, a general, and a very effective general, um, which, of course, for a Roman politician is a, is a requirement. Um, the two go hand in hand. The more successful the military man, the more likely he is to be promoted um, or to achieve the higher offices of the land. It's important to remember, though, before we get into the details of his life and the events that unfold, that the civil war that would come about between him and Pompey Magnus um, was the byproduct of a political campaign. So we, we talked about before how Roman politics, from the time of the Gracchi brothers, really, had become increasingly uh, infused with violence, with, with voter intimidation, with mob violence, with um, electioneering of all sorts, bribery, every dirty trick that anyone could pull to achieve the highest offices in the land, they did. Such were the stakes, um, and it, 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 it's, it's a competition between the most prominent individuals uh, who see themselves as being the right people to be in those offices and Caesar would be one of these. Um, we can argue about you know, whether we think them to, to be narcissists and psychopaths, and, and I've said before, I think a lot of them probably were. Um, it's also worth pointing out that in addition to promoting their own glory, they were trying to, I think, in, in, their, in their mind, to improve Rome, to save Rome. And of course, um, it is about their glory, but officially that they don't say that. It's always about the glory of Rome. Rome comes first. Any politician, any general seen to be promoting his own glory and honor above that of Rome um, is considered dangerous, and this will be the case with Julius Caesar as well. Um, but um, and some, some have argued that Caesar was the greatest genius that Rome ever produced. Um, and that had he lived, he, some of his reforms might have actually saved the Republic. Uh, others argue that he would have set himself up as the first emperor of Rome. Uh, but it, it's unclear. We'll go through the details of his life as we understand them um, and make our own assessment. So around 102 BC, Caesar is born in, oh, by Caesarian section, according to an unlikely legend. Um, his mother was Aurelia, and his father was Gaius Julius Caesar, same name as his son, who was a praetor at that time. We've encountered him before um, during the Italian social wars. His family had noble patrician roots, and they were neither, but they were neither rich nor influential in this period. His mother, sorry, his aunt Julia was the wife of Gaius Marius, right? Remember that from before, who was the leader of the Populares faction, um, and. The Rome of Caesar's youth, the period in which he grew up, was extremely unstable. He grew up in the midst of that that crisis precipitated by Marius and Sulla, um, and would become would get into Sulla's uh, target line. Uh, an element of disorder ruled the Republic, which had discredited its nobility and seemed which seemed unable to handle its considerable size and influence. And, you know, again, there are many reasons why this, this was happening, but one of them seems to be the, the fact that, that Rome is a city-state, and as such, it's not perhaps best, pardon me, best positioned to govern an empire. It lacks 
the kind of modern governmental machinery that a federal system or an empire, a modern empire, uh, might be able to to, ma to manage. So it's it's still very much focused on Rome itself and the, the aristocracy within it. So um, in 85 BC or about 85 BC, his father Gaius died. Um, Caesar was about 16 years old at the time. He seemed he remained very close to his mother Aurelia. Um, as I say, though he comes from an aristocratic family, his father is, is his family is not very rich at the time. Um, he was betrothed and possibly even married. We're not entirely sure. A wealthy young woman named Cassutia. This was soon broke. Either the betrothal or the marriage was broken off pretty early, um, and at the age of 18. Uh, he married a woman named Cornelia, the daughter of a prominent member of the Populares faction. She later bore him his only legitimate offspring, a daughter named Julia, after his aunt. His uncle Gaius Marius had enrolled him in the Flamen, as the Flamen Dialis, that's the high priest of Jupiter, um, when he was just 16 years old. Uh, however, the optimate dictator Sulla stepped, uh, stripped him of this honor and ordered Caesar to divorce Cornelia, who was the daughter of, the, of his rival, Cinna, um, or risk losing his property. When Caesar refused, and we saw this before, but this, these are more details of it, Sulla proscribed him, listed him amongst those to be executed and property uh, seized. Caesar then went into hiding. Um, the refusal to divorce Cornelia had required not only bravery, but also loyalty and a strong measure of patrician arrogance as well um, as a willingness to trust in his own good fortune. Um, a complex web of Roman aristocratic alliances saved him. So the family of Caesar's mother, Aurelia, had been instrumental in supporting Sulla, and they pushed strongly for his case. Um, the, the, the dictator eventually gave in, lifting the prescription um, with a resigned shrug and saying, as we saw before, he saw many Mariuses in this young boy. Even so, Caesar decided he it would be to his benefit to leave Rome um, and embarked on a military career in Asia as a staff officer at that time. <clears throat> um, Marius, having enrolled him uh, into the, the ranks of the priesthood, was a way of grooming him for early political office. Um, again, most prominent politicians in Rome were, were, were military commanders. Many of them were also priests as well, since religion um, goes along hand in hand with the state. So in 79 BC, Caesar was on the staff of a military legate and was awarded a civic crown, oak leaves, for saving the life of a citizen in battle. His general sent him on an embassy to Nicomedes, the king of Bithynia, to obtain a fleet of ships. This is before uh, Pompey Magnus's settlement of the east in Bithynia will become um, a Roman province eventually, but it's got a king at this point, um, and, and Caesar has been sent to obtain a fleet of ships from them. He was successful, uh, but subsequently became the butt of gossip uh, that he had persuaded the king, who was well known to like young men, uh, only by agreeing to sleep with him recall the poems of Catullus that we looked at previously. Whatever he and King Nicomedes got up to, Caesar managed to keep uh, the king on side and his mission was a success. He was able to borrow much of Nicomedes' naval fleet, which he then used in a successful assault on Mytilene in the service of the Roman, Roman navy, the Roman military. Uh, and for this he received the civic crown, which was quite an honor. It would be like a modern medal of some type equivalent. Um, when Sulla died, the dictator, in 78, Caesar returned to Rome and began his career as an orator or lawyer. Um, throughout his life, he was known as an eloquent speaker and as an elegant man about town. A military career was essential, as we've said, for an aspiring young aristocrat who sought higher offices, but it was not the sole means to that end. The likeliest career path was um, to, to, to that sort of victory in the cursus to to rise up in the cursus honorum, the, the course of honor, uh, was to practice the law. Romans were intensely proud of their legal system. We'll learn more about this when we come to Cicero, uh, which ensured their rights as free citizens, and law was the only uh, intellectual activity in which they felt entitled to look down their noses at the Greeks, who d dominated all the other arts and sciences 
law was the only field um, in which um, a senator could work with dignity. Uh, this was because the law was not distinct from political life, but often served as a legal extension, a lethal rather extension of it, with political rivalries often being fought out in the courtrooms. So a successful prosecution could uh, could enhance one, um, one one's career or destroy another one. And I dare say, as I say, law was the area in which the Romans excelled uh, or exceeded the Greeks in, in intellectual activity. We owe a great deal to the Romans for their legal system. Most modern legal systems today in the West derive either directly or indirectly from it. Apart, interestingly enough, from English common law, uh, which comes mainly from the Vikings. But, um, but Scots law, interestingly enough, is, is closer to um, Roman law. So um, in 75 BC, while sailing to Greece for further study of rhetoric, uh, Caesar was kidnapped by Calician pirates and held for ransom. Uh, so this is quite a famous story uh, about Caesar in, in his youth. When informed that, the, that they intended to ask for 20 talents, he was supposed to have in, insisted that he was worth at least 50. Hard to say how much of this is exaggerated, but um, this, is, this is what we're told, at least in Plutarch. So this is from Plutarch's biography of Caesar, chapter 2. He says, first, when, and remember, remember, of course, this is, this is before Pompey Magnus has cleared the Mediterranean of pirates. Piracy is a big problem in Rome, uh, for the, in the Mediterranean for the Romans. And clearly, and Julius Caesar has, has fallen afoul of these pirates. They were, they were capturing aristocrats like Caesar and ransoming them, ransoming them for large sums of money. Well, this is what Plutarch says. First, when the pirates demanded a ransom of 20 talents, Caesar burst out laughing. They did not know, he said, who it was that they had captured, and he volunteered to pay 50. Then, when he had sent his followers to the various cities in order to raise the money, and was left with one friend and two servants among those Calicians, the pirates, about the most bloodthirsty people in the world, says Plutarch, he treated them so high-handedly that whenever he wanted to sleep, he would send to them to tell them to stop talking. For 38 days, and with the greatest unconcern, he joined in all their games and exercises, just as if he was their leader instead of their prisoner. He also wrote poems and speeches, which he read aloud to them, and if they failed to admire his work, he would call them to their, their faces illiterate savages, uh, and would often laughingly threaten to have them all hanged. They were much taken with this, and attributed his freedom of speech to a kind of simplicity in his character or boyish playfulness. However, the, the, the ransom arrived from Miletus, and as soon as uh, he had paid it and had been set free, he immediately um, manned some ships and set out sail from the harbor of Miletus against the pirates. He found them still there, laying at anchor off the island, and he captured nearly all of them. He took their property as spoils of war and put the men themselves into the prison at Pergamon. He then went in person to Marcus Junius, the governor of Asia, thinking it proper that he, as praetor in charge of the province, should see to the punishment of the, of the pirates. Junius, however, cast a longing eye at the money, which came to a considerable sum, and kept saying that he would uh, need more time to look into the case. Caesar paid no further attention to him. He went to Pergamum, took the pirates out of the prison, and crucified the lot of them, just as he had told them he would uh, when he was on the island, and they imagined that he was joking. Um, again, I don't know how much this is exaggerated, but there, there does appear to be quite a bit of truth to it, at least, and it speaks something, I think, of Caesar's character. In 72 BC, he was elected military tribune, um, and, and, and this is, note that Pompey and Crassus were consuls for, for 70 BC, um, so he's, he's, his, his career is rising along around the same times as they are achieving their higher status. 69 BC, he spoke at the funerals of both his aunt Julia and his wife Cornelia. On both occasions, he emphasized his connections with Marius um, and the ancient nobility of his family, revealing a notable talent for self-dramatization uh, and a, con a conception that there was something exceptional about him. He seems to have believed this from an early age, in which I'm sure it, it helped promote some of his activities. Suetonius Coates, uh, Suetonius quotes from this speech in his life of the deified Julius Caesar. So 
This is Caesar giving the speech at his at the funeral of his aunt Julia. <clears throat> Caesar says, on her mother's side, my Aunt Julia was descended from kings. On her father's side, she was related to the gods. For the Marcius Rex family, that was her mother's name, goes back to Ancus Marcius. For the Julii, to which our family belong, go back to Venus. Pardon me. Her family is therefore distinguished by the sanctity of kings, who are mighty amongst men, and by the majesty of the gods, to whom kings themselves are subject. Um, <clears throat> this... <clears throat> this no doubt helped him quite a bit um, with his career to promote his family connections with divinity um, and famous ancestors. 68 or 7 BC, Caesar was elected quaestor, um, and this is, this is a kind of treasurer, remember, and obtained a seat in the Senate. So when he goes into that office, he's automatically a senator for life. He married Pompeia, the granddaughter of Sulla. Um, Caesar supported Gnaeus Pompey and helped him get his extraordinary generalship against the Mediterranean pirates, later extended to command of the war against Mithridates, Mithridates in Asia Minor. You will recall Pompey's extraordinary commission by the Manilian Law, which Caesar supported. 65 BC, he was elected Curule Idol, um, and th so this is a magistrate position in charge of sort of like public food supply and other civic affairs and spent lavishly on games to win popular favors, uh, large loans from Crassus, remember Crassus, member of the Triumvirate, a uh, very wealthy man, made these ex expenditures possible. <clears throat> there were rumors that Caesar was having an affair with Gnaeus Pompey's wife, Mucia, as well as the wives of other prominent men. Um, hard to say how accurate this is. It, it might well be Caesar attempting to deflect accusations that he had had sexual relations with King Nicomedes, and, and specifically that he had been the receptive partner in that relationship, which would be quite negative for a Roman of his status publicly. In 63 BC, Caesar spent heavily on, in a successful effort to get elected Pontifex Maximus, chief priest, um, and in 62 he was elected praetor, so his career is rising, um, not just in the ranks of the Senate, or the Cursus Honorum as it's called, a course of honor, uh, but also in course of course of honors, but also in the uh, religious area as well. He is now the chief priest, Pontifex Maximus. Um, he divorced Pompeia because of, of her involvement in a scandal with another man. Although the man had been acquitted uh, in the law courts, Caesar is supposed to have said the wife of Caesar must be above suspicion, suggesting that he was so exceptional that anyone associated with him. Uh, had to be free of any hint of scandal. Uh, and, and then maybe, I mean, this, this could be the case that he wanted to get rid of her anyway, and this gave him a pretext. It's not entirely clear. Uh, it doesn't look like she actually committed adultery, but he used it to get rid of her. In 61 BC, he was then sent to the province of further Spain as proprietor. In 60 BC, he returned from Spain and joined Pompey and Crassus in the loose coalition called by modern historians the First Triumvirate, which we've already seen, um, and by his enemies at the time as the three-headed monster. In 62, Pompey had returned victorious from Asia, and he'd been, but he'd been unable to get the Senate to rectify, or ratify rather, his arrangements and to grant land to his veterans. Uh, soldiers because he had uh, disbanded his army on his return and Crassus was blocking his efforts. Caesar persuaded the two men to work together and proposed to support their interest if they helped him get elected to the consulship. In 59 BC, Caesar was elected consul against heavy optimate opposition led by Marcus Porcius Cato the Younger, uh, a shrewd and extremely conservative politician. Caesar married his only daughter Julia to Pompey to conciliate, consolidate their alliance. He himself married Calpurnia Pisonis, the daughter of Lucius uh, Calpurnius Piso. Caisonius, uh, sorry, Lucius Calpurnius Piso. Caisonius was the man's name. He was a leading member of the Popularis faction. Caesar pushed Pompey's measures through, helped Crassus' proposals, and got for himself a five year term as proconsul of Gaul after his consulship was over. So what does it mean that he's proconsul? This is like the governor of a province um, or the governor of a state in the, for a US comparison, if you like. Um, he's got it for five years. He has essentially the same powers as a consul, except 
just in his province. Um, so he can raise armies, he can command armies, he's immune from prosecu prosecution as well, quite crucially. Um, so he gets he gets that office of, of, of proconsul, uh, or will have it after his consulship is finished. Um, however, he used some strong arm methods on in the assembly and completely cowed his optimate colleague in the consulship at Bibulus, so that jokers referred to the year as the consulship of Julius and Caesar, instead of the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus. Um, Caesar was safe from prosecution from such actions as long as he held office, but once he became a private citizen again, he could be prosecuted by his enemies in the Senate. So we're told that Bibulus was afraid to come out of his house. This is his colleague as consul. There's meant to be two of them. They're meant to have veto powers over each other. Um, but angry mobs of, of Caesar's supporters kept Bibulus inside so he didn't get to go to the office. Um, and Caesar essentially was effectively sole consul, but, but not technically. Um, in 56 BC, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus met in Caesar's province to renew their coalition, since Pompey had been increasingly moving toward the Optimate faction, and Pompey and Crassus were to be consuls again, and Caesar's command in Gaul was to be extended until 49 BC. What did he get up to while he was in Gaul? Well, um, we'll be looking at some of that more in the seminar. Uh, one, of course, big sticking point is that the war itself might have been illegal. Uh, we'll look at Caesar's rationale for going to war in Gaul in the first place. His territory is Cisalpine Gaul, this, this side of Gaul, um, this side of the Alps. But he'll go into Transalpine Gaul and will and will take the rest of Gaul um, and add it to the Roman Empire. We'll look at the, the, the pretext that he uses. It, he claims that some of Rome's allies were attacked, and this, this gave him uh, the, the reason, the, the casus belli, uh, the cause of war to go and attack, but it, it, it is debated. Um, he left Rome for Gaul uh, and would not return for nine years, in the course of which he would conquer most of what is now Central Europe, opening up these lands to Mediterranean civilization a decisive act in world history. However, much of the conquest was an act of aggression, one would say, or that's an interpretation, prompted by personal ambition. Um, fighting in the summers, he would return to Cisalpine Gaul, northern Italy, in the winters and manipulate Roman politics through his supporters. In 56 BC, um, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus met in Caesar's province to renew their coalition. Um, as I say, as, as Pompey, had, Pompey had been extending have been, have been increasingly going towards the Optimates faction. It's, it's starting to unravel. But um, in addition to conquering Gaul during this time, before he embarks on a civil war, Caesar will have lead a three-month expedition to Britannia. Um, this was the first official Roman crossing of the English Channel, uh, although he didn't establish a permanent base there. Now, the Greeks had actually been to Britain earlier in the third century BC, a man named Pythias of Massalia had traveled uh, around uh, the coast of Spain into Britain. He witnessed tin mining in Cornwall um, and, and traveled the length of the land, as far as we can tell, and possibly even further north into the Arctic Circle to witness pack ice. We're not sure if he went to Iceland or, or somewhere in, in Scandinavia, but um, he, he witnessed pack ice. This will be about the only account of, of Britannia the Romans will have had. Going to Britain was a major publicity coup for Caesar, even though he doesn't take the territory official, well, he, officially he does, officially he conquers Britain, pardon me, but, um, but what he actually does is, is go and have a few fights, claims the province for, for, for Rome, and returns. Um, it, it's more of a symbolic gesture. Taking his army to Britain, it's it's like conquering Narnia. Britain was this this mystical fairy land on the borders of of, of the empire, on on the on the edge of the world, as far as the Romans were concerned. Um, it was a major publicity coup. It, like I say, it would be like uh, sailing your army into for, <laughs> sailing your fleet into Middle Earth or something from from Rome and, and taking over um, 
the land of the hobbits or something the, the shire at any rate it, it, it was an it was an epic endeavor and it, it really aided caesar's propaganda campaign so um the first expedition took place in the winter of 55 bc against britannia and, and the reason for going actually was was in some ways legitimate because the 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 Celts in Britain were related to the Celts in Gaul. They were essentially the same people, at least in the southern part. And, and the British Celts were helping out their, their Gaulish cousins. Um, so this was, this was to, to, to try and put a stop to that. So after some difficulties in crossing the channel, his men didn't want to go, uh, his troops engaged in a number of skirmishes with the natives. They'd been supplying the Gauls with reinforcements. The British tribes had initially offered their obedience to Rome uh, through envoys to Gaul, but then when Caesar first arrived, they took advantage of the difficulties uh, he experienced in the crossing and attacked him. They were defeated uh, and swore oaths of obedience, rendering up prisoners to the Romans. However, when they observed Caesar's navy had been damaged by the various, by the high winter tides, um, they attacked again, and again uh, were subdued after considerable fighting. Peace was established. Caesar returned to Gaul, but some tribes rebelled while he was away, and Caesar returned again in 54 with a second, uh, larger expedition and put down the revolts. Britain was nominally claimed by Rome at this point as a province, but it wouldn't be revisited by the Romans in any military capacity until the reign of the Emperor Claudius in the next century um, and had to be reconquered at that time, or most of it had to be reconquered. Caesar describes uh, some notable, with some notable inaccuracies the lands and peoples he encountered in the Gallic Wars. And I'll read you his own description of, of, of Britannia. He says, The interior of Britain is inhabited by people who claim, on the strength of an oral tradition, to be aboriginal. The coast, by Belgic immigrants who came to plunder and make war, nearly all of them retaining the names of the tribes from which they originated, and later settled down uh, to till the soil. The population is exceedingly large, the ground thickly studded with homesteads, closely resembling those of the Gauls, and cattle are very numerous. For money they use either bronze or gold coins or iron ingots of fixed weights. Tin is found inland, uh, and small quantities of iron near the coast. The copper uh, that they use is imported. There is timber of every kind, as in Gaul, except beeches and fir. Hares, fowl, and geese they think it unlawful to eat but rear them for pleasure and amusement. The climate is more temperate than Gaul, the cold being less severe. The island is triangular in shape, with one side facing Gaul. One corner of the side on, on the coast of Kent is the, leading, is the landing place for nearly all the ships from Gaul and points east. And lower, the lower corner points south. The length of the island is about 475 miles. Another side faces west towards Spain, it is this direction, in this direction is Ireland, which is supposed to be half the size of Britain and lies in the same direction, distance from it as, as is Gaul. Midway across is the Isle of Man, and it is believed that there is also a number of smaller islands in which, according to some writers, there is a month of perpetual darkness at the winter solstice. Our inquiries on the subject were always fruitless, but we found by accurate measurements with a water clock that the nights are shorter than on the continent. This side of Britain, according to uh, the estimates of the natives, is 665 miles long. The third side faces north. No land lies opposite it, but its eastern corner points roughly in the direction of Germany. Its length is estimated at 760 miles. The whole island is 1,900 miles in circumference. Not, not exactly right, but, you know, not bad for, for the time. He also adds, By far the most civilized, civilized inhabitants are those living in Kent, a purely maritime district, whose way of life differs from that of the Gauls. Most of the tribes, differs little rather from that of the Gauls, most of the tribes in the interior do not grow corn but live on milk and meat and wear skins. All the Britons dye their bodies with woad, which produces a blue color, and shave the whole of their bodies except the head and upper lip. Wives are shared between groups of, of 10 or 12 men, especially between brothers and between fathers and sons. We don't know if that's true. Uh, but the offspring of these unions are counted as children of the man who, uh, with whom the particular woman cohabited first. These descriptions are clearly meant to portray the Britons as uncivilized savages uh, in need of Rome's 
civilizing influence. Uh, after the conquest of Britain, Caesar returned to Gaul to continue cam his campaign uh, there, having effectively stopped uh, or, or, at any rate, limited the reinforcements coming from Britain. Worth pointing out that we've actually, archaeologists have discovered Caesar's camp near in Kent or thereabouts where it was, where it was located. Um, and leading up to the entrance of, of the camp were discovered along the path a number of skulls placed on posts. Um, these would have been skulls of, of defeated Celts in, in Britain, and they would have been put there uh, as a warning to any others not to attack. So it, it seems that, that Caesar encountered some pretty harsh fighting while he was in Britannia. Meanwhile, Caesar's coalition with Pompey was increasingly strained, especially after Julia died in childbirth. Plutarch recounts this as follows, says, In Gaul, Caesar found letters which were about to be sent across to him. They were from his friends in Rome and advised him of his daughter's death. She died in childbirth at Pompey's house. Great was the grief of Pompey and great the grief of Caesar. And their friends were greatly troubled too. They felt that the relationship which alone kept the distempered state in harmony uh, and concord was now dissolved. For the babe also died presently after surviving its mother a few days. Now Julia, in spite of the, the protests of the tribunes, was carried by the people to the Campus Martius, where her funeral pyres were held and where she lies buried. In the following year, Crassus, the third member of the triumvirate, received command of the armies in the east, but was defeated and killed by the Parthians. Things were starting to unravel. By 52 BC, uh, Caesar had defeated Vercingetorix, chieftain of the Gauls. He describes the final battle in Vercingetorix's surrender in his, his Gallic War. I'll go over that in a minute. It's worth pointing out, he refers to Vercingetorix as the king of the Gauls. He doesn't appear to have been an actual king. He appears to have been a chieftain who was then elected by the other Gauls to lead them in battle. Um, what you don't get as much of from Caesar is, is just how sophisticated Celtic Gaulish society was. It wasn't centralized like the Romans. Uh, it was very decentralized, but there were a number of cities connected by road networks and trade networks all over the continent. Um, and and, and they, it was a different kind of civilization. Technologically, they, they weren't much different from the Romans. Um, they had access to many of the same things. They were less advanced, obviously, in some, some areas um, technologically, but, but had they been left alone, do, do we know what they would have ended up being like? It's, it's very hard to say. That, that didn't happen. Obviously, Caesar would conquer them. Um, this, is what's, this is Caesar's description of the final siege of Alicia, uh, where he defeats Vercingetorix. He writes, the besieged Gauls despaired at last of, of penetrating the huge fortifications on the plain, attempting to storm one of the, ste the steep ascents, carrying there all the implements they had provided themselves with. They dislodged the defenders of the towers with a hail of missiles, filled the trenches with earth and b bundles of brushwood, and tore down the palisades and breastwork with their hooks. Caesar has surrounded the city of uh, Alicia with two walls, one to keep the people in, another to keep out any reinforcements and his armies in between the two. Um, so they're being attacked. Caesar put on speed to get there in time for the fight. The enemy knew that he was coming by the scarlet cloak that he always wore, and that's Caesar riding, that he always wore in, uh, to make his identity. And when they saw the cavalry squadrons and cohorts following him down the slopes, which were plainly visible from the heights on which they stood, they joined the battle. Both sides raised a cheer, which uh, was answered by the men on the ramparts and all along the entrenchments. The Romans dropped their spears and fought with their swords. Suddenly the Gauls saw the cavalry in their, in their rear and, and fresh cohorts coming up in front. They broke and fled, but found their retreat cut off by the cavalry and were mown, mown down. As it was, a large number were taken or killed by the cavalry, which was sent in pursuit and, ret and returned with their rear soon after midnight. The survivors dispersed to their homes. 
we have a speech from Vercingetorix himself. Now, how did how did Caesar uh, record this speech? Did he make it up? Not entirely clear. But this is the speech that Caesar says Vercingetorix made. The next day, Vercingetorix addressed an assembly. I do not undertake the war, he said, for private ends, but in the cause of national liberty. And since I must now accept my fate, I place myself at your disposal. Make amends to the Romans by killing me or surrendering me alive if you think it best. A deputation was sent to refer the matter to Caesar, who ordered the arms to be handed over and the tribal chiefs to be brought out to him. He seated himself at the fortification in front of his camp, and there the chiefs were brought. Vercingetorix was delivered up and the arms laid down. Caesar set apart the Aduan and Avernian prisoners in the hope that he could use them to regain allegiance of those tribes. The rest he distributed as booty to the entire army, allocating one to every man as slaves. When the results of this year's campaign were reported in his dispatches, a thanksgiving of twenty days was celebrated in Rome. Vercingetorix was stripped naked and made to kiss a Roman eagle in submission. And, so, and he was held in prison uh, so, for six years, and six years after his capture, Vercingetorix was exhibited before the Senate and the people of Rome in Caesar's triumph, where he was ritually strangled. Rioting in Rome, um, meanwhile, uh, led to Pompey's extra-legal election as consul without a colleague or sole consul. Without Julia and Crassus, there was very little to bond Caesar and Pompey together, and Pompey moved uh, to the Optimate faction since he had always been eager for the favor of the aristocrats. In 51 BC, the conquest of Gaul was completed. Caesar set up an efficient provincial administration to govern the vast territories. He then published his history of the Gallic Wars, which he had been writing along the way, from, from which I've been quoting. The Optimates in Rome attempted to cut short Caesar's term as governor of Gaul and made him uh, and made it clear that he would be immediately prosecuted if he returned to Rome as a private citizen. Caesar wanted to run for the consulship in absentia, as you may recall, so that he couldn't be prosecuted. Pompey and Caesar were maneuvered into a public sp split. Neither could yield to the other without a loss of honor, dignity, and power. 49 BC, Caesar tried to maintain his position legally, but when he was pushed to the limit, he led his armies across the Rubicon River, uh, that's the border of his province, on the 10th of January, which was automatic civil war. So he, he was allowed to command his army inside his province, to take it outside his province into another province, uh, in this case northern Italy, um, was a no-go, but he did it anyway. As he crossed the, the stream, Caesar famously said, alia jacta est, the die is cast meaning that he was metaphorically playing his hand and the rest was up to fate. Pardon me, die is the singular of dice, plural, so it's like a gambling reference. Pompey's legions were in Spain, so he and the Senate retreated to Brundisium, as we saw before, and from there sailed to the east. Caesar quickly advanced to Rome. He set up a rump senate of his supporters and had himself declared dictator. Throughout his campaign, Caesar practiced and widely publicized the policy of clementia, clemency. He would put no one to death and confiscate no one's property. Unlike many of the previous individuals who have marched on Rome with an army, in a bold and unexpected move, he led his legions to Spain to prevent Pompey's forces there from joining him in the east. He allegedly declared, I'm off to meet an army without a leader. When I return, I shall meet a leader without an army. After a remarkably short campaign, campaign, he returned to Rome and was elected consul, uh, thus relatively legalizing his position. In 48 BC, Pompey and the Optimate faction had established a strong position in Greece by now, and Caesar in Brundisium did not have sufficient ships to transport all his legions across. He crossed with only 20,000 men, leaving his chief legate Mark Antony in Brundisium to try and bring across the rest of the soldiers. After some rather desperate situations for Caesar, the rest of the forces did finally arrive, uh, but they were greatly outnumbered by Pompey's men. In the final battle on the plains of Pharsalus, it is estimated that Pompey had 4, 000, sorry, 46,000 men to Caesar's 21,000. 
But by brilliant generalship, Caesar was victorious, though the toll was great on both sides. Caesar pardoned all citizens who were captured, including Brutus, um, but Pompey escaped, fleeing to Egypt. And, and we saw, of course, this before with Pompey Magnus. Uh, what we didn't see so much was Caesar's involvement there. So on the 2nd of October, 48 BC, Caesar, with no more than about 4,000 legionaries, landed in Alexandria. He was greeted uh, to his professed horror with the head of Pompey, who had been betrayed by the Egyptians, as we saw before. Caesar demanded that the Egyptians pay him the 40 million sesterces he was owed because of his military support some years earlier uh, for the previous ruler, Ptolemy XII, uh, the flute player. This is, this is, we'll recall this, this event when Ptolemy XII needed Rome to shore up his regime. He offered to pay them a large sum of money in exchange for some military support. The money hadn't been paid yet. Caesar came to demand it. Um, after Ptolemy XII's death, the, the throne had passed to his eldest children, Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII, as joint heirs. When Caesar landed, though, um, the eunuch Pothinus and the Egyptian general Achelos acted on behalf of Ptolemy XIII, who was 12 years old at the time, um, had recently driven Cleopatra uh, out of Alexandria. She was about 20 or 21. Um, Cleopatra had herself smuggled into the palace at Alexandria, wrapped in a rug, purportedly as a gift to Caesar, uh, although another version says she was brought in in a laundry bag. Um, and enlisted his help in her struggle to control the Egyptian throne. Like all Ptolemies, Cleopatra was of Macedonian Greek descent. She was highly intelligent and well-educated. Uh, Caesar saw her as a useful ally as well as a captivating female, and he supported her right to the throne. Um, and, and, but, but this results in an Egyptian civil war. So in, in the midst of a civil war with the, the troops of Pompey Magnus, and Pompey's dead, of course, but his son Sextus is still fighting, um, and other people are still fighting on his behalf. In the midst of the civil war in Rome, Caesar gets involved in a civil, civil war in Egypt. And the Egyptians, with 20,000 troops under, under Ptolemy, well, led by the general Achelos, but in the name of Ptolemy XII, besieged the palace. Caesar managed to, to hold the palace itself and the harbor, he had Pothinus executed as a traitor, but allowed the young Ptolemy to join his ar the army of Achelos, whom he, when he ordered the Egyptian fleet burnt, the great library of Alexandria was accidentally consumed in the flames. Now, it wasn't the whole, the whole library. It was the annex of the library. The library continued for quite some time. Um, it, was, it was defunding by the Roman emperor Caracalla, I think, that finally brought it down. The books were still there, but there was no one to read them. So Caesar can't be blamed for destroying the library, just an annex of it. In February of 47 BC, after some uh, uh, after months under siege, Caesar tried unsuccessfully to capture the Pharos, the great lighthouse on an island of the harbor. At one point, um, which cut off uh, he, when cut off from his men, he had to jump in the water and swim to safely safety. Plutarch says that he swam with one hand using the other to hold, up, hold some important papers above the water. Suetonius adds uh, that he also towed his purple general's cloak by holding it in his teeth so that, he would not be cap so that it would not be captured by the Egyptians. In March of 47 BC, Caesar uh, had sent for reinforcements two Roman legions and the army of an ally, King Mithridates, a different Mithridates, uh, arrived outside Alexandria. He marched out to join them, and on March the 26th, defeated the Egyptian army. Ptolemy the 13th died in this battle under rather curious circumstances. Although he had been trapped in the palace for nearly six months and had been unable to exert a major influence on the conduct of his own civil war with the Romans, uh, which was going rather badly without him, Caesar nevertheless remained in Egypt until June, even cruising the Nile with Cleopatra to the southern boundary of her kingdom. In June, on the 23rd of June, 47 BC, um, he left Alexandria, leaving Cleopatra as a client ruler in alliance with Rome. He left three legions under the command of, a, of, a, of an officer named Rufio as legate in support of her rule. 
either immediately before or soon after he left, Cleopatra bore a son, whom she named Caesarion, claiming that he was the son of Caesar. In August of 47 BC, after leaving Alexandria, Caesar uh, swept through Asia Minor to settle the, the disturbances there. On the 1st of August, he met and immediately overcame Pharnaces, a rebellious king. He later publicized the rapidity of the victory with the slogan, Winni Widiwiki, which means I, I claim, uh, sorry, I came, I saw, I conquered. Those three line slogans always very catchy. Three words, rather. In October of 47 BC, he, he arrived back in Rome uh, and settled the problems caused by the mismanagement of Mark Antony. We'll be looking at this in the seminar. Antony had been left in charge in Rome and seems to have handled things very badly. When he attempted to set sail for Africa to face the Optimates, who had regrouped under Cato and allied with King Juba of Numidia, his legions mutinied and refused to sail. In a brilliant speech, Caesar brought them around totally and after some difficult battles decisively defeated the Optimates at Thapsus, after which Cato the Elder, uh, sorry, Cato the Younger committed suicide rather than be pardoned by Caesar, though Caesar offered them pardon. In July, 25th of July, in fact, 46 BC, the victorious and now unchallenged Caesar arrived back in Rome and celebrated four splendid triumphs. These were over the Gauls, the Egyptians, Pharnaces, and Juba. He sent for Cleopatra and the year old Caesarian and established them in a luxurious villa across the Tiber from Rome. In a letter to, um, in a letter at this time, he, he listed his political aims as tranquility for Italy peace for the provinces and security for the empire. His program for accomplishing these goals, both what he actually achieved and what he planned uh, but did not have time to complete, was actually pretty sound and far-sighted. Um, that is, resolution of the worst of the debt crisis, resettlement of veterans abroad without dispossessing others, uh, reform of the Roman calendar, which he did, the Caesarian calendar, the Julian calendar we call it today, it's essentially our calendar uh, minus leap year, which Pope Gregory the Great added. Negotiation of a regulation of the grain dole, so the welfare state, strengthening of the middle classes in, through, through works programs and, and limiting the number of slaves that could um, be in certain types of jobs, and enlargement of the Senate to 900 members. Many of these reforms were necessary um, and, and are actually pretty moderate by today's standards, but his methods alienated most of the nobles. Holding the position of dictator, Caesar governed autocratically more in the manner of a general than a politician. He knew what needed to be done, he just ordered it rather than go through the normal processes, and this made him made a, created a problem for him amongst the elites, even those that he had pardoned fought against him. Though he nominally used the political structure, he often simply just announced his decisions in the Senate um, and had them entered on the record as senatorial decrees without debate or vote. In April 45 BC, the two sons of Pompey, Gnaeus and Sextus, led a revolt in Spain. Since Caesar's legates were unable to quell the revolt, Caesar had to go himself, winning a decisive but difficult victory at Munda. Gnaeus Pompey was killed in the battle, but Sextus escaped to become, later, the leader of Mediterranean pirate fleet. He would be a problem for Octavian Caesar in time to come. In October of 45, Caesar was back in Rome. He celebrated a, tri a triumph over Gnaeus Pompey, uh, arousing discontent because triumphs were, were normally reserved for foreign enemies. This was a triumph for defeating a Roman enemy, albeit one in rebellion. Pardon me. Uh, by this time, Caesar was virtually appearing, uh, appointing all major magistrates. Um, for example, when he when he when the consul for 45 BC died on the morning of his last day of office, Caesar appointed a new consul to serve out the term, from 1 o'clock p.m. to sundown. Caesar was also borrowing uh, some of the customs of the ruler cults of the Eastern Hellenistic monarchies. For example, he issued coins with his likeness on them. And you can note on, on the examples how, how the coin um, shows his age. Uh, it doesn't, un unlike some of the portraiture that would come later, the po this, this one illustrates his age as a mark of dignity. That would change in official portraiture. Um, he, he allowed his statues 
as well, uh, especially in the provinces, to be adorned like the statues of the gods. The Senate was constantly voting him new honors, the right to wear the, the laurel wreath in, in, in public in purple and gold toga, and to sit in a gilded chair at all public functions, um, inscriptions such as, to the unconquerable god, etc. When two tribunes, Gaius Marilius and Lucius Flavius were opposed to these measures, Caesar had them removed from office and from the Senate. So you see how this is becoming problematic. Uh, in February 44 BC, Caesar was named Dictator Perpetuus, Dictator for Life. Uh, on the 15th of February, at the Feast of the Luper Lupercalia, this was a, a fertility ceremony. It's, it's their Valentine's Day, in fact, it's probably where our Valentine's Day comes from. Caesar wore his purple garb for the first time in public. At, a public, at the public festival, Antony offered him a diadem, a symbol of Hellenistic monarchy, but Caesar refused it, saying Jupiter alone is king of the Romans, possibly because he saw that people didn't want him to accept the diadem, or possibly because he wanted to, to end once and for all the speculation that he was trying to become a king. It's a curious event, and, and, and depending on what Caesar actually intended or how much of it he planned, you know, we get a different interpretation. But anyway, this is what Plutarch, this is how Plutarch describes it. Plutarch says, there was added to these causes of offense, the, his insult to the tribunes. It was namely the festival of the Lupercalia, in which many write that it was, it was anciently celebrated by shepherds and was also some connection with the Arcadian Lycaea, uh, the wolf games. At this time, many of the noble youths and the magistrates ran up and down through the city naked for sport and laughter, striking those they met with shaggy thongs, and many women of rank also purposely got in the way and, like children at school, present their hands to be struck, believing that, uh, pregnant, uh, that the pregnant will thus be helped to an easy delivery and the barren to become pregnant. It's a fertility ritual. Uh, these ceremonies Caesar was witnessing, seated upon the rostra on his golden throne, arrayed in triumphal attire, and Antony was one of the runners in the sacred race, for he was consul. Accordingly, after he had dashed into the forum and the crowd had made way for him, he carried a diadem around which, um, which a wreath of, of laurel was tied to and held it out to Caesar. There was, an, there was applause, not loud, but slight and preconcerted, says Plutarch. But when Caesar pushed away the diadem, all the people applauded. And when Antony offered it again, few. And when Caesar declined it again, all applauded. The experiment having thus failed, and this is Plutarch's interpretation, Caesar rose from his seat after ordering the wreaths to be carried up to the capital, and then his statues were seen to have been decked with royal diadems. So two of the tribunes, Flavius and Marilius, went up to them and pulled them off, and after discovering those who had first handed Caesar, hailed Caesar as king, led them off to prison. Moreover, the people followed the tribunes with applause and called them Brutuses, because Brutus was the man who had put an end to the royal succession and brought the power into the hands of the Senate and people instead of the sole ruler. At this, Caesar was greatly vexed and deprived Morellus and Flavius of their office. So I think, I'm not sure how much Plutarch really understands of what's going on here. I'm not sure what he's reporting is accurate. This is his interpretation. Um, at any rate, we'll talk about it more in class. Caesar was preparing to lead a military expedition against the Parthians uh, to, to take back the lost military standards and golden eagles that had been stolen or taken from their, the legions of Crassus that had been defeated. Um, he was due to leave on the 18th of March. Although he was apparently warned of some personal danger, he nevertheless refused a bodyguard. Uh, and Plutarch details the signs and warnings of Caesar's death as follows. And I'm not going to go through that, except to say that there was a, a soothsayer who had warned him to beware of the Ides of March. Um, and Caesar, on the day, said to him, Well, the Ides of March are come. And the seer said to him in reply, Aye, they are come, but they're not gone. So, on the 15th of March, 44 BC, Caesar attended the last meeting of the Senate before his departure, uh, held at the, its temporary quarters in the porter, portico in, of the theater built by Pompey the Great, um, the Curia located in the Forum, which was the regular meeting place of the Senate, of course, had been, had been burnt down, was yet to be rebuilt. The 60 conspirators, 60 of them, led by Marcus Junius Brutus, Gaius Cassius Longinus, 
Decimus Brutus, Albinus, and Gaius Trebonius, came to the meeting with daggers concealed in their togas and struck Caesar at least 23 times as he stood at the base of Pompey's statue. Legend has it that Caesar said in Greek to Brutus, you too, my child, because Brutus's mother, Servilia, had been one of Caesar's lovers. And it's entirely possible that Brutus was Caesar's son. Um, Brutus is one of those Pompeians whom Caesar had pardoned. After his death, all the senators fled and three, and, and three slaves carried the body home to Calpurnia, Caesar's wife, a few hours later. Um, Plutarch's is considered the most accurate account of this event and detailed, um, more so than Suetonius. I won't go through that now. This is something we'll be looking at in the seminar more so. Um, Caesar's funeral pyre was built on the campus Martius, to the, uh, next to the tomb of his daughter Julia. A golden shrine was established in the rostrum, modeled on the temple of Venus Genetrix. Inside was an ivory couch with gold and purple coverings. At its head stood a pillar uh, draped with clothes he was wearing when he was killed. Instead of the funeral oration, Consul Mark Antony read out a decree from the Senate in which they had voted all honors, both human and divine, on Caesar. Magistrates and ex-magistrates carried his funeral beer uh, from the rostra into the forum. According to Suetonius, something happened though. While some were arguing that it be burned in the temple of Jupiter on the Capitol and while others in the hall of Pompey, on a sudden two beings with swords by their sides and brandishing a pair of darts set fire to it with, with blazing torches. And at once the throng of bystanders leapt upon its, in, in, leapt, he, heaped upon it dry branches, the judgment seats and the benches and whatever else could serve as an offering. Then the musicians and actors tore off their robes, which they had taken from the equipment of the triumphs and put on for the occasion, rent them to bits and threw them into the flames. And the veterans of the legions threw on their arms, which they, with which they too had adorned themselves for the funeral. Many of the women too offered up their jewels, which they wore in amulets and robes of their children. At the height of the public grief, a throng of foreigners went about lamenting uh, each after the fashion of his country, above all the Jews, who even flocked to the place for several successive nights. Caesar was beloved by the Jews, uh, not, not only because he had overthrown Pompey, who had uh, violated their Holy of Holies, but because of many acts of kindness besides. <clears throat> for several days, there was a political vacuum, for the conspiracy apparently had, had no long-range plans, uh, and as a major blunder, did not immediately kill Mark Antony, allegedly based on the decision of Brutus. The conspirators had only a, a band of gladiators to back them up, while Antony had a whole legion and the keys to Caesar's money boxes. Later, Caesar's heir and successor Octavian, uh, after he put an end to the civil wars and punished Caesar's assassins, had constructed a grand Templum Divi Julii, Temple of the Divine Julius, uh, in his adopted father's honor, where the latter was perpetually worshipped as a god. Um, in the final analysis, Caesar was truly a gifted politician, an abnormally energetic um, individual with the ability to get things done. Uh, he was, as I say, a, a, a superb military commander, a very skillful politician, an excellent public speaker, trained in the arts of public speaking. Um, but his downfall was, was in no small part due to his sort of off-handed handling of, of politicians, of, of his alienation of the senatorial elites. He knew what needed to be done and was setting about doing it, but he didn't go through the proper channels. He didn't obey the forms. Um, and, and, and this, I think, is what led to his demise. Was he intending to set himself up as a king of Rome? Would he have restored the Republic? These are questions we have to ask and that have not really been answered, but we'll discuss it more in the seminar for those of us that are there. Thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you enjoyed this.